benefit at the end of the day is I'm not going to push myself to rush through this. I'm, we have some time. I'm going to try to keep this under 50 minutes. Um, but I have a lot of slides. This is an advanced presentation about web forms, really getting into APIs. So if you're doing custom stuff, how to kind of get the lay of the land and, and get the most out of the web form module. So the, my name is Jake Rockwitz. Uh, I'm known as Jay Rockwitz on the web. I'm a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and maintained the web form module for Drupal 8. Uh, this is a new slide I've added to my deck because I've just decided that I kind of want to in my presentations, just always say welcome to the Drupal community, especially pe for people who this is a new first conference they've attended. I want to just emphasize I really believe in this. It's like we're a diverse and inclusive community. Uh, you're part of this massive community by attending this conference, and you know everyone should figure out ways they can contribute to the software and to the community. Um, there, there are a lot of resources available. Um, about the basics of the web form module. So I've recorded a lot of videos to get you started. Um, this is an advanced presentation, and they sh in advanced presentations just teach you a few things, a few new things that inspire you to learn more. So you don't have to walk away and know everything I'm talking about, but when you start diving into the code, I hope this will help you get started and be like, okay, I understand how to work with this code or what I'm looking at. And building advanced web forms requires leveraging hooks, understanding plugins, building render arrays, and writing tests. And I'm going to step back and talk about the basics because I do want people who are new to web forms to get some familiarity and also this will help us as we're talking about APIs. The, the web form module is a powerful and flexible open source form builder and submission manager for Drupal 8. It provides all the features expected from a proprietary form builder combined with the flexibility and openness of Drupal. And the use case for the web form module is that you would build a form or you can copy a template. You'd publish that form as a page note or block. You'd collect these, the form submissions and then you'd send out confirmations and notifications, aka emails. And you'd review those results online and then you could distribute those results as a CSV by downloading them or you could even remote post them to a third party service. And this is the use case. It's, it's build, collect, distribute. And just keep that in mind as you're building your forms and as even in your workflow you should think about that process because you have to build the form and then decide how you're going to deal with the data and then where's it going at the end of the day. And the demo, I'm just going to kind of walk through the full stack of the web form module and start in the beginning and I, this is notes for me so I make sure I cover all the areas. And we, there's a clean install and I always use the contact form for my demo and the, it's a really standard contact form that we're all familiar with. In the demo, I just like to kind of do this add a company field. So you click add element, and this is the form builder UI in the selection, and company will be a text field. Go through. Can expand. I'll, I'll do expand all so we can see everything. So it web form ships with reasonable defaults, so really you only need to enter the name of the field, which is company. But there's all these options that you need to explore, and I've documented them to add custom snippets and help bubbles and field every aspect of your elements under control, but just know you don't need to fill these out. You just can hit submit the bottom. And we've got a company, and we'll do a preview of it. And it's right there. And I've made a deliberate mistake where it really should say your company and should be moved up and required. And I want to show you the alternate way to edit things in the web form module where you can go into the source mode. Because of course you can go here and check off required and change the label, but you can go in the source and look at the code behind the form. And we're going to talk about this code the markup. This is YAML, and I'm going to move it up under your name. I'm going to change the label to your company and show a very simple, very powerful thing that you can cut paste snippets of code from one place to the other. And I'm going to make it required. And now I'm going to switch over to the test tab, which is another feature where it just allows you to quickly test your forms by populating it with dummy data. And it's populated. I'm going to hit send. It's going to go in the back end, and now it's sent out an email, and we're really switching gears because we're we've just built the form, and now we're getting into the email and confirmation notification of it. I'm going to switch over to settings. I'm just going to give you a peek of you have control over the emails, and this, this contact form expectedly sends out a confirmation notification, and I have some screenshots of the details inside. What we do want to know is where the submission is going, which is a results table, and you get a preview of it. And this has some simple features where you can customize the look and feel of it. And you can click through and look at the individual results. And 
What's good about this view is for developers, it gives you a couple of different perspectives. This is just the simple submission HTML view. You get a table view of your very long forms, you can review it. There's a plain text, because sometimes you send plain text email, but this one is really important to see, because this is the raw data that you, if you're going to manipulate, is going into the database and coming out of it. And you can see it's a very simple array of data, and these are the properties attached to the form. Um, that is, oh, I'm just going to quickly say, because we're also trying to get that point of getting it out of here, exporting it, and there's a download tab and we can download it and for the demo it's really helpful just to show you an HTML table. You have all the settings you'd want to control for that table. How the headers look, how the, the data, the, the actual values are structured, for example entity reference which is getting peak where you can say give me the ID, the title, the URL. Um, but I'm going to show it to you on screen, hit download, and there's this little table and if you check the box to open Excel it would just pop open in Excel and you've got this What's cool is you've got an HTML table that you can fully control, and that's one of the things we're going to explore. Uh, moving forward, so I'm including a lot of resources. I'm covering tons of materials. I'm not going to go into much explanation of the resources, but the deck is available on the camp, and these are just more information that you can go with, and these are all the resources available to get more on the basics. I decided to put testing first because everyone puts it to the last of their presentation and the last of their workflow. I think is one of the most important things. And I think this is the most important thing I personally want to say about testing, is it confirms expectations. And I personally value this slide like this, it's a simple statement. And what I want to emphasize to you is that's the goal of tests. It confirms that things work the way you expect. And I think we've got slightly muddled ecosystem where everyone throws all these testing frameworks and makes them very complex and confusing and you feel overwhelmed to not write tests because you're supposed to do B hat or this or oh you're not using that latest JavaScript framework. But focus on the need to confirm that things work as you expect. And that's how I've done the test in the web form module and I'm going to kind of walk through what do I need to confirm in the web form module when you look at them. How things are going to render, how an element is going to output, how the default value is going to be processed. Are validation messages working correctly? I have tons of settings. You need tests to confirm your little settings are going to work, the layout, that things are going to happen. And the last one is probably one of the biggest ones you always want tests for, and I've learned the lesson repeatedly and painfully, access controls. That's how you make things secure. You verify your permissions work the way you want. And some best practices for tests, and this goes, emphasize the simplicity, sometimes approaching it very simple. Uh, for web forms, you can create a test module and dump in the config directory an example form, and then run your tests off that example form. Like if you create a custom element or a real complex workflow, and you can just write a test that just goes through that. My experience with WebForms is that all these features, and it's kind of building on um, other concepts. It's just like component-driven design is this concept. You break things down into smaller parts. I break every WebForm element down to the smallest possible part. So every element has a dedicated test, a dedicated form that you can review exactly that single piece of functionality. That's how you build complex systems, by breaking it down into simpler parts. Um, also, it's, I've written a lot of tests, so I've, I think when you're doing test frameworks or getting into it, try for repeatable patterns. If you're going to call, like I have a helper function that I can post a submission to any web form by passing in the web form object and it just figures out what the, for example, the submit button's label is going to be, and it does a post. It just saves me a little time. Um, and in tests, you need to, you can think about organizing and grouping your sub, like grouping your tests into subdirectories. It depends on the level of complexity. If you start browsing the webform module, what you're going to see is, I've broken, the elements are in a dedicated subdirectory that you, has all the tests that go through just elements. The settings have a dedicated subdirectory. And I, it took me a while to learn that lesson, and I gradually, as I build out more tests, I keep breaking them down more and more, because you have to figure out how to manage them. And the bottom two are really important, is um, it's okay to have easy to repeat manual tests. There are a bunch of them in the web form module, because I am not a JavaScript expert, and sometimes writing JavaScript tests can take too much time. But every little JavaScript widget I have has a form that will demo how that JavaScript is going to work. And if someone says, the confirmation, uh, confirmation page is not opening in a modal dialog. I have a manual, quick, easy way to be like, okay, is it working or is it not? Or if they say it's not working in this browser, because JavaScript tests, if you run them, they're only running in Chrome. So someone might say, oh, he's not working. So keep that in mind too. You just want to have a way to confirm things work. 
And this one's a really important one is having some tests is always better than no tests. And having really basic tests is just a great way to get you starting to think about it. And a, a good solid example in the web form module is every element I create a test, but sometimes I don't create too enough test coverage, but it allows me if someone files an issue, I have a starting point. And I can go into that test and start iterating on it and building it out. As issues or regressions happen, it just gives you a place to, to work on. And I want to talk about tests a little bit more, but I just want to emphasize the web form module is still using deprecated simple tests because I started a while ago. But you should only write PHP unit, and, and you know, we're working on migrating them. I'm going to do a, just a demo of the walk through the front end. What I'm talking about, about having all this test, like test forms. I'm going to back up. So you guys are getting a peek at my local development environment. And this number, like this is the first time in a presentation where I'm like, yes, there are 225 test forms shipped in the web form module. These are, every time I add a new feature, I create a test form that is an example of the feature and I verify that it's going to work. Um, the two examples I want to talk about is confirmation, I think, is a good one because there's a lot of variations of confirmations. This gives us a quick preview of the list and AJAX, so we have AJAX support and I want to confirm that when you do an AJAX submission, the confirmation will work as you expect. Um, I'm going to jump to the modal. So this is a very simple test where you can say, you know, hello, sorry, typo, and I hit submit, and it pops open a little modal dialog via AJAX. And it's very simple. Someone says there's a bug, and I go quickly check it. The other one, before I jump to some of the code, talk about email. So there's a test for an email element. Um, the web form ships, you know, there's a standard email element core, but there's tests for multiple values, where you can enter in multiple email addresses that are common to limited and you can quickly test the functionality here. And what I want to give you a peek at, and I, I want to also emphasize that there's tests, you can go look at these test modules and get you know, an idea of all these forms and how they're structured. And if I go ahead, so I'm, gonna just, I'm trying to keep the code really simple, but I want to give you a starting point to think about when you're writing these tests. And this is this email element that I just talked about, and it just calls it, loads it, confirms that the label is going to be there, and then it checks that the input looks correct, and this is the default description that says, you know, multiple email addresses may be separated by commas. It can be customized. There's a test later to check that. But then here's, here we go, testing the validation. Passing basic, passing XX, and does the post, and boom, you get an error. And this just helps guarantee that your elements are working as you'd like. And this is the confirmation logo. And even though I'm not testing the JavaScript, I am testing that some of the output that I would expect is being rendered, for example, like JS hide and I'm um, passing in the right confirmation class modal and that it's working. And this one, confirmations can be completely customized. You can add any HTML attributes to it. It just confirms that that's working, that, that the wrapper, that's the web form confirmation wrapper, can get a border that's 10 pixels solid red. Um, and then this is a, you know, uh, the, the contact form, the fault one we were looking at, redirects to the home page of Drupal. And this is pretty much confirming that you test the confirmation URL message, it, you submit the form, it redirects and displays that to the front page. That's the sort of URL. And the last one, because I emphasize access controls, this came up recently. It was a great one that someone caught. Um, so you can turn on and off elements. The web form module ships with a password element that is turned off because you shouldn't use it. It's sending, like, if you use that, someone fills it out, your data is not going to be encrypted when it's stored in the database. But some systems need a password element, especially if you're pushing the data somewhere else and you don't, it's not going to Drupal. So someone caught that the password element was still available in the UI. And if you were calling this URL, you could actually insert a password. It wasn't a big deal, but it was worth writing a test. And the first test was, well, let me confirm text fields work as I'd expect, that it's a 200 that you can access it, okay. And password, you get a 403. So tons of resources about tests. I'm going to move on. Now we're going to start diving into kind of web form entities. And i keep it really simple. Uh, everything in Drupal 8 is an entity or a plugin. It's a good way to look at, you know, when you're starting to sift through code. Maybe I should add service, but um, entity is really important. I think people are familiar with it. So the, the summary from Drupal.org, it's, you know, any defined chunk of data includes nodes, users, taxonomy terms. And this, this description includes Contributed modules can define custom entities, and that's where the web form module 
starts using it. And I want to quantify, you know, this, the web form is an entity, and the submission is an entity. The difference is, and you've got to explore some more, but web forms are config entities. They are exportable. That's the one word I can use to describe. You can take them, pull them out to a YAML file, and move them to another server. Submissions are content entities that are stored in the database. Um, web forms is important to say, and I just make a note, that it doesn't use field API. It actually uses, for storing data, it uses a entity attribute value model for submissions. And this is the long description of it. And what's the most important thing of why it's doing that is it's a simple way to store a lot, a lot of data. And that's why that system's being used. And what I want to do with entities is show you a little on the front end of what's going on with them. And it's pretty easy. I think everyone's familiar with the Devel module. I'm not sure people are totally familiar with this amazing tool set they give you of you can browse everything on your site. So, this is every entity installed on your site. If you want to peek at it, and I do a filter on web form, you're going to see all the entities that the web form module uses. And we've talked about the web form entity and the web form submission entity. And you can click through and get a preview of all the properties. Um, options are an entity, and these are other you know, access controls and image selects. And we're going to jump to web form and just explore. I don't want to show you the nuanced differences between what a config entity is and what a content entity is. So I'm going to get this sidebar back up like this, this, this structure. Right All right. At some point, I'll get the sidebar happily here. I don't have to go. All right. We're here. So let's look at the content content form we just talked about. It is a config entity. It is exportable. There is this export tab. Everyone should be using this export tab. If you find an issue in the web form module and your form's broken, click export and attach this export to your issue and it will get resolved much faster. Because this is a pristine snapshot of everything that's going on with this form. Like, you can see every detail, every element, how it's structured, every property, every setting, every handler. So it's, it's and even the access controls. Don't include email address, of course. But um, So we've just looked at the web form, which is a config entity. There's also the test tab. If you install the web form develop module, it will add this API tab. And the reason the API tab exists for content entities like submissions, sometimes people want to write programmatic code to push data in. So this gives you a, a preview of the type of data you would push in. And it even gives you some PHP code snippets that you might want to work with. And there are other APIs, and you know, the REST API has support to push data in. But this just gives you a starting point. And I, I want to emphasize this is content. Properties, the data going in. Okay. So more on entities. Uh, I hope everyone's familiar with it, but there's a lot of great resources. So there's a nuanced thing in the Web4 module called the source entity. And a source entity tracks and creates creates a relationship to the Drupal entity from which a web form was submitted from. Um, the idea here is you have a form on your site, you put it on a node, it tracks that. And it allows web forms to be reused multiple times because you can take the same web form and put it on multiple nodes and you're tracking data to that node. And I can explain it a little bit more as we go on. And this source entity can be determined multiple ways. The most standard one is you put it on a page and it figures it out. It looks at the route and says there's a node here and I'm going to store that but you can also pass it through query string parameters. And if you install the web form node module, those are source entities. If you put a web form as a block, it tracks source entities wherever that block is. And even paragraphs start tracking the main source that the paragraph is, is, um, exists on. And in the UI, as you're looking at submissions, there's a column called submitted to, and that tells you what the source entity is. In this example, I'm going to use a little pointer, this is an event tracking system, so the event registration, and this is tracking all the events this submission has, it, this form has been submitted to. Um, and source entities can be used to track, site feedback is the most simple example of a source entity. You can take a feedback form, put it on every page of your site, and you will track the feedback for every page of your site as people enter in comments. Um, event registration, same thing, except now it gets a little more complex. You create an event node, you attach a registration form to it, and now you have the ability to register for your individual events, and you're tracking those individual registrations. Um, application evaluation is a much, a very complex demo that I'm working on. Um, that's where you have like people applying for jobs, and then you want to, so they filled out a form, they created a record, 
And then you want to get feedback on the record, so you're attaching another web form to that job application and their evaluations, and people are filling out comments and saying, hire this person or don't hire. Also works since we're at Princeton, we should say it works well for college applications. Um, the demo to walk you through source entities is there's a web form node module. I'm going to jump up to it. Here. It adds a references tab, and this tracks all the instances of this contact form on the site. And I can click here and it'll generate a web form node. So it's an instance of this contact form associated with this node. And pre fills out because it's passed in the query string parameter. And I'm going to hit save. And now this is a node. This isn't the original contact form. The way to kind of show you how it works is I'm going to do test. And hit send. Click back. I'm going to go to the results tab. This is a dedicated results tab for just this node. So we are only tracking submissions to this node. If we move back up, because I submitted the form before, and we go over here, and we got two results, and so we click through. You can see that first submission I did in the demo, the earlier demo, doesn't have source any because it wasn't attached anywhere. But now it's saying it was submitted to this new contact form that we created. So you could have kind of personalized contact forms, you could track their own individual ones. Okay, moving on. So now I want to, like, to really understand the web form, you gotta start digging into code. And I'm starting really simple. This is the code behind, if we, there's the ability to pass the source entity through a query string parameter. And it's a plugin called the query string web form source entity. You probably won't edit this, but it's a good starting point to make. It's a very simple method, get source entity, query string parameter, it passes through, it looks, it makes sure it's valid, and then it gets here, it gets the ID, sees it exist, make sure it exists, and then it loads the source entity. And then it figures out, well, can I, is it going to load an accurate source entity? And it returns it, and that's how the tracking kicks in. And probably never touch it, but what it, this gives me an opportunity to start talking about interfaces. And this has got, one of the points, I talked about testing, this is one of the other big takeaways. You must code to interfaces and think about things in terms of when you're curious to figure out how something works, if it's done right, there's going to be an interface that's going to give you a description. And this one is an incredibly simple interface. It's the source entity, source entity interface, and all it has is this one method, which just is like, get the source entity, figure this out. And you can pass and ignore types. And you know the example is we don't really want a web form to consider itself its own source entity, so that's kind of why that property is there. I'm going to move on, and now we're going to jump to form API, because now we want to get to like, okay, we've got the source entity, let's talk about building forms. And web forms are render arrays which contain elements that build, validate, and submit form value using Drupal's form API. And that's why we're jumping up to form API. It's a hard transition, but web form uses form API. We're relying on it, we're built on top of it. Uh, so we've got to just explore this for a little while. And to even take a step further in Drupal, render arrays are the building blocks of Drupal content. Everything you see on a site, it's a render array. If you're looking at a header, it's a render array. And what is a render array? Well, I'm going to give you a screenshot. I'll have to redo this to give you a like, Here's exactly what a render array is, but this, I'm going to come back to it. Drupal's form API, um, an overview. So when we're talking about this, it's like an element is anything displayed on a page. An input is an element that collects data. A composite is a group of elements. And a form is just a collection of elements and inputs. And this is a form. And this is the render array behind the form. When we look at the source, this is the definition of how that form is going to look. This is in YAML. And you can see this is exactly the form we just talked about. And I think it's important because the web form shows you YAML, but really in core, when you're talking about forms, it's PHP. And this is the same form in PHP. And this is how most forms are built in core. And that's why I'm including this snippet where this is not web forms, but this is the site information page in core, where you're talking about site details, the site name, showing you know, you load some config, and then you're building that form. That's the default form when you enter, what's the name of my site in Drupal? Um, and this, so with talking about forms, and I want to emphasize, you got to think about how things are broken down. Forms are how Drupal handles forms. It's you build the form, you validate the form, and you submit the form. And then you jump to the interface, and guess what? The interface mirrors that exact thing where you have build, validate, and submit. And you'll see this start coming through in every single web form API 
And this makes a lot of sense too, because you want your forms to have a unique ID. Um, it's probably one of the first interfaces I looked at in Jubilee. And some more resources, to, you know, Form API is definitely worth getting familiar with if you're exploring Drupal, developing things. Um, and with Form API, you need to create form elements. And a form element is defined using a render array, which is processed by, and this is getting to details, a render element plugin, which creates an input on a form. Um, plugins, to kind of give a definition, are small pieces of functionality that are swappable. And I like this slide because it's very simple, like why plugins, why? Well, they're reusable, they're standardized, they are all, they have the same interface, and then ultimately they're extendable. You can always look at a plugin and then extend it and change it and enhance it. You can even swap out a plugin if you're unhappy with it. And so for form elements, they're plugins, and they extend render elements, which are plugins. And with form elements and render arrays, when we're talking about it, it's important to emphasize that Properties of an, a rendered element begin with a hash symbol, and every form element must have a key. So when we switch over to examine one single element, like the name field, that's the key. And it's all labeled there in your label. This is the type which defines, this is a text field. This is a key, this is the most important property here. And really just showing, you know, you can pass some extra attributes in. And the next slide just shows you what you're going to get back from Drupal, which this is the rendered HTML, and then this is the markup that all that data gets converted to. And you can see the styles come through, and I also like emphasizing, you know, default values get added to all your elements, and Webform does a lot of this for you too. Um, so when you're editing that markup, you only need to enter the key information, which is the label and the type. So with this form element plugins, there, this is kind of like a, a big picture overview. If you're gonna do, you have, if you want custom elements, you have to build a form element. So, you're going to have to call these methods, which is define the properties behind that element, set how that default value, how a value is going to look. If you have a custom complex values, you're going to have to set a value callback. Um, how that element's going to be built, how it's going to be rendered, how it's going to be processed, which is similar to build, but it's like at that point when everything's built and together, how is that data going to work? And then there's a little like render, how's it going to get pushed to the theme layer? And then this big one, which I'm going to emphasize in the next slide, is how's it going to get validated? If you have a, like uh, the email on the core, you need a validation callback to confirm that it's a valid email address. Even though you're using the HTML5 input that should do it, you need something on the, the server. Um, to get started with form elements, always copy and extend an existing element. There's just no reason to start from scratch. You could take a text field and tweak it to do your own behaviors. Um, the element validating callback, this is just a nuance if you get into the code behind form elements, is it is the only way to alter the submitted value going to the server. It's a little bit of a weird nuance in core. And what that means is, uh, the example would be if you're looking at the confirm your email address element. It takes two passwords, password one and password two, the validation callback confirms that those two match. But what you want submitted to the database is not two passwords, you want one password. And if you look at the callback in the password confirm, it actually merges the two values and sends only that back to the server. Um, and similar on the note, like I'm talking about password elements, they have two, you know, you're rendering something that has two elements, you need to use a tree property if you're doing anything complex with a form element, because what the tree property does is takes all that data and keeps itself contained in an associative array. And this is the example of the text field, and I think it's just a very simple, what I like is it's very simple. You know, we're just talking get info, there's nothing to describe. This is a great nuanced value callback that I don't think people know works, Core does that, but Core is smart enough where if you have a text field and you have character terms in the default, in the default value of character terms, it's like we really don't want to truncate that data, and it strips out those character terms and makes some spaces so you don't lose data. Um, I always thought it worked that way until I saw this. I was, I was like, oh yeah, that's not an HTML spec thing. Um, and then this is just being rendered. Basically, how it's going to go to the theme layer and passing your ID attribute, your ID, these properties get converted to attributes. And this is a ridiculously simple interface. I found it so amusing that it's, for form element, all they care about is the value. How, because that's what they're about. It's an input that collects a value. This is the only method that's absolutely required. So more on that. Now, the reason we started this is to get to web form elements, because if you want to create your own custom elements, 
Web form elements are just wrappers that enhance Drupal elements. So you have to create a form Drupal form element first to get a web form element. And it requires a corresponding form element. And the key thing there is that you would create, for example, with text field, you'd have a core shift with a text field. Web form has a web form text field element. And they have to have the same pound type, like the same plugin ID. That's what drives all these elements. And web form element plugins handle everything. I'm trying to prepare you for some really big slides. Um, related to an element. It is all in comp. So you see all those features? That's what this plugin is doing. Um, to help organize them, I do do a lot of base classing, and I'll try to give you a kind of better understanding of that, but I try to be like, well, here's all the behaviors for text elements. Um, and I also found with base classes, you can also use traits. So traits are just like taking common methods and putting them into a little reusable space, and then you can kind of plug them in as you need them. And for, it's for behaviors. Um, with element plugins, kind of breaking it down, and it gets a little more complex in form elements because we're getting into you got to define the default properties, how you're going to prepare that web form element to be rendered, and then we get into just determining the behaviors. Does it support multiple values? Does it well, or it has multiple values checked? And because web form is doing more than just here's a form element, we're rendering data, we're you, you can build the HTML version of that submitted data. And then even the exporting has get the table column, get what, what is the columns that we expect to export when we're pulling out that element. And I think if anyone's used the UI, you've got this configuration form. So it's, there's a, the form method to build out that complex configuration. And these demos are now really going to just focus on like, in the UI, you can now get around and get familiar using Devel and some of the tools with the Webform module, just like what's going on? And then you can dive into the code. So I personally have a transition back and forth. There's a report for web form plugins, similar to views plugins. So you can see all how views are going to work. This is a list of all the elements installed. So there's the 90 elements. Um, I'm going to switch over to text field. Here. There we go. Um, this is an admin tool. It just shows you the layout, like how it's working. You can also navigate this in PHP Storm, but it shows you there's a text-based class. It shows you all the different info metadata around a text field. Uh, you know, like, is it an input? Yes. Is it a container? No. Container would be something like a details element. Um, is it a composite? No, it's a single value. Can it support multiple? Yeah, well, in web form, you can have a widget that allows you to enter multiple text field values. Um, and then this shows you all the properties behind it. And it shows you even related components. And I use that. Um, this helped me figure out when you're in the UI, you can go into an element and say, change the type. And if it's similar, you can switch a text field to an email element if you want it. And there's even a tab here that gives you a quick UI to just test the element. Ju and by the way, this emphasizes break things down into smaller parts. Because this is just a text field in a single form. And it gives you like a little preview of what the values are. And I can go in and say, well, let's hear add some X's to this, and here, I'll just show you a, a cute feature. More, this is more, and here, we'll open up help. Here, my typing sucks. This help, hit save. You get a little ring, like a preview of it. And I've used this when I was building a new elements to kind of sort out some of the properties and behaviors and check things, and it gives you an idea, here's the markup. There are examples in the web form module. If you're starting with this, use the examples, look at them. So there's an example of a simple element, and there's an example of a composite element. A composite element would be like an address field. You know, getting city, state, zip, um, street, and there's, those are great starting points. And I actually have some code snippets coming up for a composite. This is the interface, and now that's why I'm like, you're getting a lot. And this is not the full interface of the web form um, element plugin. But it gives you the idea of the power you have when you start creating it because, yes, you're defining the full properties. There's a lot of metadata you can pull out. But then, even in the processing, you can have how it's being initialized. So, initialized would be used if um, that's like the most basic information you're adding to an element as it's going to go out. Um, rent prepare is you're going to create a form right now. And finalize is adding little nuances at the end. And sometimes you need those. And this is how you're going to display it, at whether it's HTML or text. And these are just helpers. I go out of my way to kind of make it possible in every plugin that you can hook into things that are happening. And you can hook in with your element when a submission is being created or when it's being loaded 
or when it's being saved or deleted. Um, this makes it possible to do little nuanced behaviors to the data. Um, I use it heavily in like file, file uploads because we're going to want to like clean up a file upload. Uh, we change the file name sometimes to max the submission. And also there's a configuration form for it. This is a good example of, a, so this, by the way, I showed you this crazy list of interface you know, methods and it's like overwhelming. But if you go into the web form example composite element, this is pretty much what you're going to see of what creates a composite element. Because it's extending a web form composite base, which is a lot of code. It's setting things up to collect multiple inputs. All you have to do is define, okay, get the info, which is deriving it from there. You have to define how you're going to render it. So you have to define a template, a theme template to go out. And then you're just defining the elements. So this is an example of a simple first name, last name. And this would display first name, last name. And the parent class handles a lot of the complexity. Um, a, this seems like a, a big pattern that people are using in custom code, because this can make a big difference if you want something reusable. Um, the example would be if you're collecting user information, you could build a composite element to collect your pristine user information and keep it standardized. So for creating elements, you got to create a custom module. You have extend or copy an existing form element plugin. Just always do that. Um, going back to testing, so you start doing these custom elements, create a test form, create a test module, get that element into that form so you have a, just here's the element I'm expecting and how it's going to work. And then you start, by the, what, what's funny is you, you can do a test form for just a basic form element. You don't have to have the web form element plugin, but then you also, once you have that form element working, Here's a text with their renders. You have to define the web form element, get it integrated into your system and the custom behaviors. And yeah, I just want to emphasize, write tests. It makes a huge difference. Um, so we're done with, so I kind of started with that use case, build. We've talked about building forms for a while. We're going to switch over to that process, the handling of submissions. So implementing web form handlers. And, <coughs> Handler plugins are used to route submitted data to applications and send email notifications. And these are handlers in the UI. This is that in the settings form. This is the list of the default ones. I'm not going to go into it too much, but we, we, by the way, the email is sitting over here. There's a scheduled email handler that you can schedule emails to be sent at any date in the future. Um, these are, the remote post is a big one where you can take the data coming in and push it to another server. But sometimes it's worth creating your own handlers. Like the remote post, I'll emphasize, there's a huge limitation here because it can't do authentication. I can't figure out authentication system. What, what authentication system your remote server is going to need? And you're going to want to, a lot of advanced use cases extend that remote post and wrap it with OAuth authentication or whatever quirky authentication you need. And we'll go back to the email handler. Yeah, this is just an example of the email handler where it's simple, collecting that data. And just an overview, like what I'm talking about when I say web form handler plugin. Well, it contains methods that act like hooks. I hope that helps people coming from Drupal 7 kind of understand what this is doing. And hooks are little, be little snippets of code that hook into the behaviors that are happening in Drupal. I mean, that's like the most basic way to look at a hook. And typically, handlers react to a submission state. When someone hits submit, that's a, that, that invokes a handler. When someone saves a submission, that also invokes a handler. Um, if they validate, same thing. Um, I added this in because it's important like for really advanced stuff. All those handlers support conditional logic. So you can conditionally send out emails based on what someone's entered, and you can even remote post based on the data. And we're starting, you're going to start seeing patterns. I'm just hitting on some of the big concepts behind handlers. You, can get, you, you have to have a configuration form, and that's what this is. You can override settings via handler. The best use case for that is you have a handler, and you want to change the confirmation message. In your handler, you get the data, you process it. Maybe you call your remote server, and it gives you a custom confirmation back, like, congratulations for registering, and it, it has a, a unique code. You can go in here and override what's going to happen with that web form. So that, that confirmation page will have a custom message completely. Um, and then you get into just the classic, listen, oh, my D got still in there. Um, I deleted that. Thank you for that. Uh, you can alter elements. You can alter every aspect of what the heck is happening on that form. So you can alter the form, elements, how they're created. 
The element alter would be someone adds an element to a form and you have a remote server and database and you need to create a column in that database. You can figure that out. Entity operations, what people are familiar with. Yeah, that's the create one. And you can even track when other handlers are being created. That's how, like, everything. And I have a slide at the end that emphasizes why I think that, that how important it is to be able to do it. Track and get in the way, well, not get in the way, but be able to capture everything that's happening. To show you handlers, it's kind of now we're getting into this pattern that's just available for you to browse what's going on. So if I go into, i to fix that. There's a dedicated report that just lists out handlers and it lists out all the ones that are installed. There's not, there's a lot less going on. So we're getting to a simpler and simpler plugins to talk about. But cardinality is a good one to just point out. Like when you're building handlers, you can set cardinality. What that means is the number of times that handler can be added to a form. For emails, you could have hundreds of emails, therefore it's unlimited. The debug handler can only be added once because it doesn't make sense to display 100 debug messages. Once you do it once, it's fine. Um, and you can also say whether the handler requires data to go into the database because the webform model does allow you to decouple and not decouple but not have data hit Drupal's database. You can take that data or remote post it. It's a nuanced thing because I'll give you an example. Scheduled email handlers have to store data in the database. We have to know, we have to have a submission to send a month from now. Um, remote posts don't because we're taking that data off. Okay. Keep going. So this is from the example handler module. So everything, well export doesn't have an example, but handlers have an example module. And you can go in and look at it, and this is a, a very brief kind of example of it where just showing the default configuration, and the example is basically like, well, let someone enter a custom message. And this is the custom message, and when someone gets to the confirm process, they've finished a form, it's been validated, and goes to the confirm page, it pulls the message, does some token replacement, and then it adds a status message to the page. And that's it. And so now we're getting to the last plugin, which is just exporting. So we, we kind of walked through, we got the data, it's in Drupal, we want to pull it out. And you can download it as a spreadsheet or a table. So exporter plugins are used to download submissions into spreadsheets or other applications. And that's what we downloaded before. It's just this form where you can pull down, drop down, pick the format you want. And this is some overview of it. This is one of those plugins always extend an existing web form exporter. It doesn't make sense to start from scratch. I can't see any use case where you might want to customize the table, but are you going to start from scratch and organize it? Um, an example of like if you wanted to make a more advanced CSV, use the delimited exporter to create those CSV files. And sometimes people forget with the export, I, I showed in the UI, but there's a drush command that you can automate that export and get a spreadsheet and you know do bash, you can push that to anywhere. And this gets a lot simpler because really, if you think about when you're exporting data, you're setting a configuration, you're writing that data, and there's actually just some stuff occasionally for file names. So you want to maybe have a custom file name for the, ex the exported file, like add a date to it. And the demo, not much to this demo, I'm kind of glad to because it's a long day, just list out the exporters that come with the web form module. Give you a, a, just a quick one, like the delimited is the CSV, just so and YAML is just a way to take that data and kind of, I don't have any honest use cases for it, but it was a very easy export to give people a starting point. I could see people going and using them as examples to build a very custom XML export where they need to get XML data structured in a certain way. And the table, that's really useful for building custom Excel spreadsheets because you can kind of, you're doing an HTML table and it opens in Excel and you can brand the heck out of that. Um, And this gets a lot simpler on the interface because really talking about, and I only pulled these, these three things. This is, if you're doing a custom export, these are the three methods you need to pay attention to. Uh, writing the header, so the table, you're just opening it, and then writing the submissions out, and then closing that table in the footer. And I'm only pulling this example. This is just the, the table exporter. This is just writing a submission. So this is just generating that table row. Um, what I hope inspires you is it's well structured because right, the preparing of that data has got this dedicated method, so you just call that. So in most cases, you might not want to manipulate that, but then it just writes out a TD, does a TD align. If you want to add row colors or custom class, CSS, you can do it. 
You can extend this, you can manipulate it. Are we done now? Okay, that's Lily. Uh, this is like a moment to appreciate. She's now nine. This is her costume where she was a tiger lily. Um, okay, and I catch my breath. And this gets, now it gets into hooks, implementing web form hooks. Hooks are functions that define or alter behaviors. And web form and Drupal hooks overview. So handlers and plug, um, handler plugins and hooks are very similar. They are tools to get in the process of things that are happening and capture behaviors. A nuance to handlers is when we talk about the UI is you're taking a handler and you are attaching it to a single web form. So here's an email, I'm attaching it. And this is gonna do. Hooks have the power of, they're applied to all forms. You create a form alter hook, if you, do, if you create a, a hook form alter, every single form in your entire Drupal site will go through that hook and you can manipulate and change behaviors on it. So there's a power to hooks. Um, and when we're talking about hooks with web forms, everything's an entity, so we just talked about that. All the entity hooks are available. So if you need to manipulate submissions, you can call standard Drupal entity hooks. When I say entity hooks, it's like, you can capture when a submission's being pre-saved, or when, oh, a great one is uh, people need to, occasionally with web forms, it's being created and they want to just set some default values. So they use, you know, hook web form create, and they can tweak some default values or even add custom properties to the web form config object as it's going out. Um, yeah, so, it's important that, you know, there's hooks, but plugins and event subscribers, which I'm not even touching upon, but they're the new hooks in Drupal 8. So when you're kind of transitioning, keep that in mind that you should try to use plugins and be comfortable with them. The hooks still exist. And this is an example of some of the hooks. I'm gonna dive into one or two, but like really just one. But I just wanna, you know, for people who are just trying to understand, everyone should be familiar with this, but if you're new to like Drupal encoding, some of these are very standard, form alter hooks. So when a form's being rendered, you can alter it. Every individual element can be altered. Um, if people are familiar with the web form, allows you to kind of build out your options. When I say options, it would be like the list of states that you can reuse on your site, and you can alter that. Um, one power of that hook is you can actually build a stub that says, go grab me this data, and this alter hook can go out and query a database and generate a dynamic list of options for a form. And then these are standard entity hooks and then we get into really nuanced things where you can alter the libraries. The, the web form module, which we didn't go into, has, I think, 13 different external libraries. And this is a way to alter that metadata or even add your own libraries to the web form module's APIs. And access rules, just want to emphasize, and this is what, last one is what I'm going to spend a second on. I just love this hook. It is by far the most powerful hook I've ever created in my career at Drupal, I mean, like in Drupal. So, it's called Hook Web Form Handler Invoke Alter. It's a lot to digest. But what it does is it captures, so think about it this way. Forms get submitted, goes through the process, and then it invokes a handler. Every form, when you submit the contact form, it's gonna invoke the email handler. And it calls that email handler. But what this does is it sits right before that invocation of that handler and passes it. And you have this hook where you can alter anything that's happening with web forms. And we're passing in, and this is where the example is pretty powerful, we're passing in the handler plugin, so the handler plugin knows, okay, here's an email, it actually has all this metadata, like what's the web form? It knows the web form ID, there's even a get web form submission, which you could get, there's get the web form submission. Get the handler ID, so you can look at, and that's like, the handler ID I think would be email, for the email one. Then it says what's the method name, so let's, uh, I think for sending emails we do it on, Post save. So it passes in post save, and then all the arguments going in. And this example just shows you, you can get in there, I'm, okay, I'm doing contact, the email confirmation, post save, I got the submission, and do something else. Um, this gets into crazy stuff where you could, like, every remote post going out, you can add metadata to it, or you can analyze the data before it goes into the remote post. I mean, it's kind of endless. Um, are uh, we done yet? That's Ben. So I'm so glad I had these slides. That's Ben's Thomas the Tank costume, made out of paper mache. It was a lot of work. Right. So we're at the end. Additional remote form resources. So about me, um, I have a blog. You can kind of track me and get a lot more information on what's going on with web form. Uh, a good simple example pitch for subscribing or paying attention to my blog is the next post is going to be uh, 
I'm trying to define the web form stable release cycle. So I'm writing a post to kind of say, all right, this is how we're going to go forward with releases. This is how often the releases are, how I expect to do beta, security, accessibility. Um, you can find me on Drupal.org. And Twitter, I usually just post, you know, if you subscribe to me on Twitter, you'll know what I'm writing. Um, in the web form space, there's the Slack channel, which is really a good place if you have general questions, you can post it. I do steer people to Drupal Answers now consistently because it's just it, it's just a great place for general support requests. People do respond. They want to get their little credit. Um, Slack deletes your comments after a while. And the, the Drupal Answers is the best place to have a canonical history with great search for support questions. If you find a bug, go into the issue queue. But the issue queue is for issues and not support requests. Um, and I always steer people over to the Drupal Answers. So there's a little pitch that I'm, I'm working on and adding. Um, I just don't, so support. I'm just going to read it and then explain it. Uh, support, you know, web form module and Drupal community. Get involved, in, you know, in the Drupal project and also <clears throat> consider helping to financially support the web form module for becoming a back to a backer or by making a one-time contribution to say thanks by joining the web form module's open club. This is something I just started in the new year, and I'm experimenting with just. If we can get some financial sustainability, we can try some new things that just don't happen in open source. Um, for example, I just did an accessibility self-audit, but I think it would be worth the community figuring out how to do a professional audit of the web form module, because that will solve a lot of problems for institutions that have accessibility requirements. And in my sector, I work in healthcare, I would like a HIPAA audit. I would like a professional person to go in and be like, okay, this is what you need to do to collect secure data. And I mean, some of it's generic, but some of it's just needed for Drupal. Um, and I'm just pushing people, and I'm going to spend some time encouraging people. And if you want to ask any more questions, I will make another pitch because this is important with Open Collective. It's just, okay, what I also learned about this pitch is what is Open Collective? I keep forgetting to say that what it is. It is a transparent way to collect funds to help open source projects. And it's broader than that, but that's what Drupal Drupal's using it for. And the idea is that you become a backer. And you can see, one, you get credit, meaning we show who the backer is. And any transaction that happens, you'll see what happens with that money and where it's going. Um, another open collective that people, everyone joined, I joined it because I, I use Simply Test Me all the time. It's a place you can go and just spin up a Drupal instance and test any code quickly. And that has a concrete need, infrastructure, server. They have to pay those bills. And everyone who uses Simply Test Me in their day to day should be back in. All right, I'm done. Ralph, that's the last kid, says thank you. Any questions? Is there any uh, significant difference between your 7 and 8 versions? Huge. Oh. Monster. Like, it's a complete rewrite. So, I, I mean, the, the difference is it's a complete rewrite from the ground up that I started in a separate space because Webform was a very complex system and it was kind of hard. They had some struggle figuring out where to start upgrading. And we decided, like, I, there's a history, and I have a blog post about it, but I was in this space called YAML Forum, and really the first version was just that YAML that you'd edit. Um, and all the APIs have been rewritten from scratch. The data is stored in a similar way, and there is a web form migrate module. I'm actually calling that out in my next post, because it's really significant. We, everyone knows that there's a migrate module, and it's maintained, so there's a way to get there. But it's a different user experience. The goals have stayed the same. It's building forms and collecting data. Um, one nuance to, like when I describe that, it kind of points out, I'm not doing that analytic. The, in the web form module space, I'm not generating those pie charts anymore. That, that's done in a dedicated contrib module, because it seems kind of a peripheral task that not everyone needs. Other questions? Oh. Um, in one of the examples, you had an event registration. Um, yeah. Have you ever worked with integrating with like commerce, and so the next, like basically when someone filled out a web form for an event, you mm -hmm. would generate a commerce order that then they is that a good use case? Yeah, it's absolutely, absolute, okay, the, the question, now I've got to get better at this. Repeating, the, and um, with the event registration, you might want to collect, the question is how can you use, you know, handlers to push a commerce transaction, and the example was using an event registration. Um, there are a lot of plugins out there, so I have no commerce experience. I have huge admiration for commerce, because I did spend time just sifting through the code and be like, wow, this is just brilliant. But I haven't done a commerce project. Um, there are some web form commerce handlers that will kick off transactions. Um, 
and they just need people to work on. I mean, there's a lot of integrations happening. And that's kind of what, going back to the open cloud, I think that's a, the big opportunity is, yeah, we have this great tool to build forms, and then the strength of our community is these integrations. And we need to work on them. And we need to really push them and build them out and get them working. Commerce is one. It might even figuring out, uh, never do credit card transactions on your site in Drupal. It's point, like I'm hesitant, that's just a personal opinion. We need to figure out how to integrate with these third-party services and get those transactions off of Drupal. And like, we need to get Square integration, PayPal integration, and how that works with web forms, and try to get it as clean as possible. Any other questions? Um, I keep getting hammered with uh, idiotic Russian emails for my contact form. Mm -hmm. Pretty easy way to just say digit uh, if I detect Russian characters. People have asked that, we, well, I really recommend using a, uh, a spam protection system, and I'm just going to show a few, because, uh, I mean, by the way, I did not navigate through every detail, but there's an add-ons page that lists, because we're talking about integrations to going to commerce, so you can go here and filter and see what commerce, is there a commerce plugin? Yeah, commerce web form order. I wouldn't know if it meets a requirement. For spam, we can filter. There's a whole series of spam stuff. You gotta try these first. Because the Russian character thing gets, I had people there like, I wanna put a hidden field that detects a pattern and does submission limits for this one word. Yeah, it's dangerous, because you get into slippery stuff. My, okay, so for spam, what? I can't just, just dump it, you know, it's like don't send the email. I know. Let, let, it, let it appear as if it goes through, and yeah. nothing happens, and then you're done. I guess the answer is there's no reason you couldn't write a handbook for that. Yeah, you, you can do it. Um, but uh, it's worth just doing a quick spam thing is my professional experience is Honeypot is great, works really well, CAPTCHA helps a lot, and I did like Molem and ClearTalk, we're not using it, but that is this kind of replacement to Molem where they're doing real analysis of it, and I found that concept works really well. Um, just depends on the level. I've been using Honeypot, and then the problem is I get to hit from so many different IP addresses. Yeah. Until it yeah, it gets a pattern, um, but they, they seem to, uh, you know, just the one C2 disease here and here and there, it's just enough to, just annoyance. That's all. I, that's I, why I was lucky that if I could trap uh, on a character set, I could just. You can definitely do it. It's not, that's a trivial, I mean, like, if you post on Stack Exchange, someone might even give you a code snippet okay. where you're just like, track this and block it. because I want to know more about it. So, what is it called? Stop form span? Stop form span. Yeah. I mean, we need that for the robocall system, too. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's the, the, the... Yeah. Yeah, we're at the end of the day. I'm going to be around at the party. If there's another question, I'll answer it. If not, I want to let everyone kind of go home. Are you, okay, it's, okay. I can answer that and then you can follow. Um, she's asking a question about client-side validation. Okay, AJAX submissions with client-side validation are not working with the required attribute. Um, oh yeah, I know one aspect where the client-side validation module had a bug. Because So the problem with AJAX validation is it doesn't hit the submit handler of HTML5 forms. The client-side validation module, we figured out how to fix it. So if it's AJAX, it should work. Um, if you want to file an issue, we can try to figure out. It's tricky, but I think there's a way to API call it and get the HTML5. Um, a little note about HTML5 validation is it kind of sucks ass for 
accessibility. There's a huge, there are some huge problems with it. Like for people with screen readers, it just doesn't work right. Um, the spec is a little all over the place for how they read that data. And there's an issue in core turning that off. And that's a feature of the webform module. I, I turn it off on my, my forms. I use Ajax and I call the server and I get the validation and it's just, it's a cleaner UX for more users. It's a tricky one, but if you want to file an issue, we can look into it, because it's just like a couple lines of code. Did you have another follow-up question? Yes. Can you tell us again, and recaptcha I have no clue. OK, Ajax and recaptcha. Um, I am running, there are some rampant issues, not rampant, but they're floating around there with caption and web forms, because um, it's like caching layers and keeping track of the right tokens for the, the captcha get lost. And I have, I'm not totally sure it's been fixed, and like I don't know if there's a solution. I've done that. Thank you so much. I hope you had a good conference. I think we're doing the closing remarks now, right? Okay, let's do it.